really excited y'all are here today. This is supposed to be a refreshing Q&A for your moms. The first thing we're all going to do is do a yoga thing. We're just going to lean back. I want you to take three really deep breaths, particularly if you can close your eyes. I'm going to do it too. You're watching this, you need to do it too. Okay. So the reason we're here tonight is we do want to refresh you, we want to equip you, we want to encourage you, and also um, give you some tools as we enter this next part of our season. Uh, I do want to say though, if you came for um, the formula and the one, two, three, four that's going to fix your family, your children, or yourself, it's not here. So there just is a formula. So I'll start out to tell you there is no formula. And actually, it was a lie that my generation believed good parenting in, good kids out. And we were kind of sort of guaranteed if we had some really good formulas and we were doing all the right things. It doesn't say that doing, being wise and having wisdom and knowing and dealing well with your children, parenting them well, that's the wise thing to do. But there's just no guarantee to the formula. Um, I also want to tell you that if you feel there's something unhealthy going on in your life, or in your parenting, in your family, not if you know, but if you just feel it, I want to encourage you to get some help. Go to someone you trust, to a good counselor or a pastor or someone that can really get you some help. Don't stay in an unhealthy thing without reaching out. So I'm not going to qualify a lot of things. I'm not going to keep saying, and remember, I don't mean unhealthy. That's just, I'm talking about the normal mess of life when I talk, not an unhealthy situation. Also, <clears throat> I don't know if you're single or married, excuse me, <clears throat> or how you have a children, big or small, your family. I'm just going to speak generically to all of this so instead of always qualifying. Um, okay, so let's try out. But let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Cheryl Lang, and Bill and I have five children, and a really good start at five grandchildren. And I hope they're just the opening act. The wonderful thing is they all live about 10 minutes from my house. So I'm enjoying this season. It's not going to last like this, but it sure is fun. And I really enjoy it. I absolutely have loved being a mom. I really enjoyed it. As miserable and hard as it can be, and as crushing and disappointing as it can be, and just that it's not what I thought it was going to be, all of that to say, really have enjoyed it. My baby is 24, uh, six foot seven, so we grow tall in our family. Um, as a matter of fact, of all seven of us, I'm really tied for the shortest. Okay. So, um, but the most distinctive event in our lives is 20 years ago next month we lost Bill to kidney cancer and all five of our, ch our children were at home. Our youngest um, turned four the day we heard cancer for the first time and we had Bill for 15 weeks is all. And it was this excruciatingly difficult and what I thought unsurvivable as it sounds like it was. Um, our oldest had just graduated, was still at home, and it was really hard. But I am a trophy of grace, and it's the faithfulness of God is the only reason we survived, and actually that we've survived. I am a completely different person, and I'm very thankful for that. But what that's to tell you I know what it is to have parenting be really, really hard. And um, I understand some of your situations because way over half of my parenting years were done as a widow. And so um, I just want to encourage you. And that's why we're here tonight. I uh, am going to stop and gather cards several times throughout the night if we can try and get them. I figure with what I've been given, 
we can get out here about 2.30, 3 o'clock tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but if this is something that's beneficial, we might be able to have these throughout the year. And Vault is an amazing venue, and uh, I look forward to seeing what we can do. That's why I need to have your email address if I don't have it. All right, so here's question number one. Uh, I struggle, this is really a weird question, I struggle with my team not wanting to do what I ask. <laughs> Most of these questions are about this long. And then said, it was so much simpler, it felt so much simpler when he was only seven. Okay? Um, so, what I want to start you off with is a chart that helps explain part of the reason why it's harder than when, it was at, when he or she was seven. Okay. This actually comes from Ted Tripp out of Shepherding Your Child's Heart, but I've just taken it, adapted it, and used it in a lot of different ways. So, can you see the whole board here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, this is your grade when they're born, and this is let's say 20 years old, let's just grab it, 20 years old, and they leave your house. So this is zero, this is baby, all right? So you have 100% influence in their life. Oops, let me start with authority. You have 100% authority. Because they don't have any choice about any of it. Where they are going to be born, whether you're going to induce, whether you're going to use diapers, whether you're going to nurse, what side you put on, whatever, it is. Whatever you're going to do, they have no choice. You have 100% authority. You have 0% influence. Okay, that's the word influence. Alright, right, 0% influence, you don't need it because you have authority. Right? Any of you that are parents already, this diminishes very quickly. <laughs> they begin to let you know what they don't like about what you're doing very quickly. And then you get about two and it starts waiting even some more. And then you go out through childhood, you get to about 12, 13, 14, 15, and it starts this. Okay? Until you get here, and the only, that's all you have. Money. So the only place you, can get, you don't have any more authority. You can't tell them what to do, and they can decide. I don't want your money. I want to do what I want to do. All right. So actually, the only authority you have is money based. So you're going. To, this is going to happen. This is a healthy thing. This is what it's supposed to do. All right. So. my children the way I see life, you become an influence. So you want this to go. And let's just say in a normal path, maybe it really does come up significantly. And this is what we call the red zone. Okay? The teen years. Why that mom said, why is it harder? Because you're in the red zone. Your authority should be waning. Matter of fact, this might even be a steeper decline. You've got to quickly get to zero authority. And it needs to be a healthy decline. The problem is, what we want, moms, we want our influence to do this for the rest of their lives. We want our influence. I want to quit, have my children go off and just I'm somebody that's a friend of theirs on Facebook or Instagram. I want my influence in their lives. I want to be an influence in the generations of my family. This is what I want to have happen. If I don't handle this well, I'm really going to affect my influence. So the problem is handling the decreasing authority 
and works it, working on maximizing your influence. Sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a killer. Okay, it's really hard. And there aren't a lot of moms who handle it very well. Because, like she said, it seems simpler when they're seven. You cannot parent too many colors. You can't parent here in age the way you did up here. For sure you'll lose your influence. But it just didn't go to work. Honey, come sit on my lap and let's talk about it. It's just not going to work. Right? But just the parenting in general has to change. And so particularly in the red zone, you need to really hone and change and develop your parenting skills. Because it is hard. Just saying, I'll put a little sticker every time you make your bed. Things like that. And just, you can't parent the same way. Rewards can't be the same. Conversations can't be the same. Um, allowing them increasing significant independence and making choices, because that's our job. All along here, it's different from what we did back here. So remember to adjust your parenting for where you are on this scale. And remember, this is healthy. This is what's supposed to happen. Um, Cheryl? Yes? I know um, this was a really life-changing thing when I heard this before with you. And one thing I remember you said that really stuck out to me, too, is a lot of the times, because even us, we can think of a time when our like we maybe don't have a healthy relationship with our parents or they try to have still have too much authority over you and that's where you said that more than likely that parent never realized this and they continue to try to hold that authority line here where it's supposed to drop and that just really kind of was eye-opening it's like that's why sometimes even as adults our parents are still trying to tell us what to do because they don't realize the healthiness of allowing us to Very good. and so what i have to do though Write your questions down or comments because otherwise we really won't get very far tonight. Um, let's see. Okay, this is another question. What do I do about taking my little ones to the store? They don't always do what I ask. <laughs> There's a thing going on here. I know it sounds terrible, but I'm so embarrassed when it happens in front of us. How do I correct them with everybody looking on? Uh, and there's a question, what do I do? Because everybody's watching. Um, okay, it has to do with this again. Almost everything, you, this is just a background. This, this needs to be imprinted all over your parenting. Um, because this matters too. Um, the answer to it is training. Okay, That's the deal with this. These are training years. You get in here, your training years are di really diminishing. You can't teach a, <laughs> what you can teach right here, you can't train back in here. You're losing your training years really quickly. You're losing all your authority. So this is our, matter of fact, okay, I'm going to, I stuck some notes for things in here to go over them. Okay, let me tell you about the seasons of parenting. So I've broken, I'll just give them all to you now. I've broken the seasons of parenting up into four stages. And to try to help you realize what do we do where. And then you could just, so I'm really like had great graphics. So I would have this PowerPoint thing and it didn't point to the top of this. But let me just go through, this is a general guide. Um, probably, I think it actually it's on the Impact Parenting website. But uh, let me go through it. Okay, zero to five, I call it, we're supposed to be a safari guide. So zero to five would be safari guide. And what are these? These are the imprinting years. I am imprinting years. Did you know like baby ducks, when they're born, whatever they see moving and walking first, they'll follow it. Mm -hmm. So like if a farmer or a dog goes by, they will imprint and think they're supposed to always follow the dog. Wish that were that easy, okay, with humans, but so these are the imprinting years. So think about this vision. But we're in the deepest, darkest of the Amazon, okay? We're going to imprint on that safari guy because we want to know <laughs> there's an alligator or a 70-foot boa constrictor or poison screen frogs. We don't know. 
So we're going to step everywhere he wants. This is the vision of what your zero to five sort of should be. What's our job? We're to show them the way through the jungle so they feel secure in their heart and safe with you. So the first thing we want them, just like I want to trust my guide. I mean, like I want to be the first one in a line. If there are 50 people in that safari down in the jungle, I want to be the first one. I want to be imprinting very well. And we want your children first to feel safe and secure with you. Okay? And that they learn that they're learning their job is to follow you. That's what you want. Here, they're supposed to be imprinted and learning that they're supposed to follow you, as well as feel safe and secure. Uh, and that's well, their job is learning I am loved and I'm safe. And the other is, sweetheart, there's a God and you're not it. <laughs> Just like in the jungle, there's a safari God and I'm not it. And so in love and security, that's what we have to help our children so they can learn to imprint. So where's your location in these years? Close to them, but in front. So they're walking behind you. So that's the beginning season. Then our authority wanes even more. And the year is 6 to 7, uh, 6 to 11, eh, depending different children, different maturities. So about 6 to 11, and I call that being a master chef. So think about your children, if you have them in the 6 to 11, you're to be the master chef. And that 6 to 11 are the training years. This is really where you work on the job of training. So many questions I get all the time, the answer is training. If they're under 11, 12, a lot of times the answer is training mom. You've got to train them. Uh, and I'm not talking about anything harsh. I'm talking about what your life looks like as a parent. What's our job is dialogue and instruction. Dialogue and instruction. Listen to me. Not lecture and nagging. It's dialogue. How many people in a dialogue? Two. So it's to be dialogue and instruction. Dialogue and instruction. And you show it to them, and you practice. And you show it to them, and you practice. A lot of times, we literally would do a mock run-through on something. Let's practice. When we go to the store today, and someone says, or unfortunately, y'all don't have corded phones like that are stationary because my children wanted so badly to answer the phone. <laughs> so I controlled such power. Because the rule was, if you wanted to answer it, you had to be, and we practiced what you would have to say. Not yell, but they, we practiced what they said, and, and we would say, okay, practice answering the phone, and, or coming to the front door. And the graciousness of how we wanted to do, I'm not talking about robots, I'm talking about training my children in life and, and practicing we talk about. And I had one that was extremely shy. No one would know it now, but the shyest person I've ever known personally. And he didn't want to be. So I go, do you think you want to try and talk to Billy? Because you have to like, you used to have to go into banks and actually go to the desk and give them checks and things. And so he really, really wanted to look at him and thank him for the candy he was going to get. And I mean, you know, I encouraged that, but I wanted to do it. So we would roll them all at home, and he would practice and say, so what are you going to do? I'm going to say, thank you. And so we get to the bank, I go, you think you're going to do this? Yeah. That'd be great. That'd be great. And we get up and go, no problem. OK, no problem. But we would practice. So we practice. Go into the grocery store, to the store, it's a big deal. You don't want brats. Your job in society is not to take brats everywhere. And I feel sorry because who's labeled the brat? The children. But mostly, it's not the brat's fault. Okay? And a lot of it's training. Okay? Not in personal training. Really loving them so they know how to sit in the car. So they know how to walk on the side. Because here's a phrase to use. With Freedom and privilege come responsibility. 
So when they're really little, we started saying that with freedom and privilege come responsibility. And to be able to walk in the grocery store and not have to stay in the car, that's a freedom. It's a privilege. But what comes with it? Responsibility. And so we would talk about that. And there are times, I know two times in particular, I left the store and left all my groceries. I put the frozen things up, left the store, and we all went home because someone really would not own up to their freedom and privilege. And I couldn't do in the store the training, and so we had to go home. And uh, we didn't have to do that too many times. I only remember twice. So, but it's the training at home. Um, their central focus on this one, I just wanted to share this. In this season, it's the development of character. Not training like you do a dog. Okay, it's the development of character. But remember, not every wrong is directly related to the rebellion to your authority. You know, I ask you to walk alongside of me. Well, they're immature children. Okay, this is their first time in life. So not everything is rebellion. A lot of times the answer is just more training. We need more practice. We need more training. Um, and some of the wrongs, rather than being rebellion, are a direct lack of character. So this season you really want to work on character and helping them develop. Lots and lots of conversation. Uh, their job is to learn and practice and practice and practice. And that's a real grace-based thing. Hey, let's talk about it. Like, that being so shy, Alex being so shy, it was never, we didn't correct him or anything. We just, when it came up, we talked about it again. Here we go, do you want to do it? I really do, Mom. I really do. And so we talk about it, we talk about it. We practice, okay? And for a lot of years, he just, oh, I can't worry about it at all. And I wouldn't even bring it up. And then, oh, Mom, I'm going to do it today. Yeah. And so, I mean, no one who knows him, but he's now leadership trained, corporate leadership trained. Okay. He's not shy. Um, okay. Where is my location in the 6 to 11? Alongside. So we've moved from in front to alongside. Then 12 to 18, the fun years. Okay. You're a coach, not a cheerleader, not a CEO. You want to be a coach as we go through the red zone. Uh, these are the pre-flight years. Okay? Uh, and increasingly, you're exiting the training years, and you're heading towards catapulting them. So you want to handle your placement and what you do well. Uh, their job is to learn about choices and consequences. So the focus during this year, for these years, is choices and consequences. And hopefully that you're developing this um, influence so that your children will talk to you. I would say as much as you can bend to keep the conversation going, let other things go. Because this is necessary, and there is a place, and sometimes you have to. But conversation between you, not lecture, conversation is the way to have more influence. And um, good conversation. One of the best places I've found, and I've found some other parents whom I really respect, is at bedtime at night and just sitting and listening. Maybe asking the question, you need to sit and listen, developing that relationship. Um, and I'm going to tell it to you. Require, don't remind. Absolutely in the red zone. For the most part, you surely understand it. But the way you keep <coughs> nagging is you require, don't remind. Before that, you're doing a lot of training. Now we're not training anymore. You need to understand it, and then you don't remind, you just require. Uh, their job is to learn choices and consequences. How else are they going to learn it if you keep reminding them? But you make it clear, and then you stick to your consequences. Um, in my location, it's like a good coach on the sidelines 
rarely running out in the field. You do a lot of coaching from the sidelines, and then, but you don't run out on the field and tackle them during the game. <laughs> you wait till they come off the field, and then you have conversation. Another really good timing thing is you deal with it when it's the issue, discuss it when it's not. So, as a good coach, they don't think in like, you know, Popovich in the NBA, he doesn't run out in the middle of the court. He waits, they come off the court, they're in private conversations, and then he coaches well. Sometimes yelling things from the sidelines, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then 18 plus, I call this the graduate years. Not because they're graduating, but you're graduating. Okay? You're graduating from active parenting. That's this zero percent authority. That's the end of your active parenting years. And you just pretty much have it's these are for them adult years. Are they at 18, 19, 20, 23 gonna look like full grown adults? No. Okay. But that's not your job. Your job is continue your relationship and your influence. And they are adults. My job is to work at respecting their adulthood and their independence. One of mine told me, Mom, you could almost do anything, but if I even feel you're looking cross-eyed at my independence, I'm ready to walk and never see you again. So their independence is so important to them. Uh, my job is to serve, love, and pray. Of course there's some active part in there, but most of your active part has to do with money. <coughs> then you have the right to speak into it. Other than that, you want a relationship. And if you start treating them with authority, you're going to lose the relationship. Uh, work to maximize your influence. We want that green line to go straight up. So that's what you want to work out instead of training them. Okay, what's their job to figure out life? What's your location? On your knees. If you know anything about praying, I would encourage you. Uh, I spend, the nice thing about having my children grown is I get to spend more time praying for them than when I was actively working. Let me keep watching my clock. I told you. Okay. So what I want to do, you can pause this, and what we're going to do is take a little bit of a break. Uh, if you need to go to the girls' room, or what I'd like you to do, write down questions if you have them, pass them in, and uh, process a little bit with your neighbors, as some talked about, even if you're new to each other, just process a little bit. We learn them and process well with our work. So I'll give you just a few minutes, and then we'll start up again. Where do we put our cards, you said? Pardon? Where do you want us to put our cards? I'll pass them down to you, and we'll put them Okay. Be sure you put your email on there. <coughs> You are being picked up by the recorder. Uh, okay, this is our min my ministry, Impact Parenting. Uh, our goal is to equip moms impact generations. So if you're social media, we've got Instagram, Facebook, and also a website. Uh, in addition, and then, drum roll, very exciting. We are so excited to have you. This fall, we're going to start the parenting podcast. So I'd like to introduce this is Ella Netzler, Hi. and she's my uh, buddy and co-host, and so we want to bring more of this in an audio, 20-25 minute form on a regular basis to you. Woo! I'm really excited. So, not yet, but that's why you have to stay in touch. Hopefully this fall, we'll actually, we've already recorded, but we've got to get some a lot of work. If you're interested in helping us with some of this, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, I'm, I'm going to turn this off, but I want to show you something. We're talking about training. So many things, it's hard to understand the immaturity of children and what it takes to develop. Emotional regulation, there are so things. One that's really hard is for children to really understand the passage of time. I want to give you something that I think it's brilliant. Okay. This. The time timer. Because the red, you move the red uh, marker wherever you want it. I'd get a big one like this if I had children. 
If I were a teacher, I'd have them in my classrooms. Um, whatever age your child, particularly someone who struggles with time management. So you go, okay, for, you have 45 minutes to play, or you have 45 minutes to stay in your room. You have 45 minutes, you have five minutes. We're gonna go, we're gonna go brush our teeth and go to bed. Set it, 10 minutes. A four-year-old, a seven-year-old really doesn't understand 10 minutes. So this is so wonderful. They have the feeling of time passing. Otherwise, they say, we're going to go in 10 minutes, and it's over. They don't even know the time passed. This is a great thing. There may be other ones on the market. I've seen this one. I'm so impressed. And uh, parents I know that have used it, it's just taken so much burden, so much nagging off, because this becomes the nagger. It's kind of uh, required, don't remind, but this is with someone who struggles with time. If you're an adult and you struggle with time, get yourself one of these. It's a really great thing. So I just am impressed with that. There are a lot of good things out there. This one is one I really recommend to you. Um, okay. Like Amazon or something? Oh, yeah. Let me see. Let's see. Okay. I have to have a, I should have a waiting. Lots of good questions. Some of these are real long answers. Uh, it's interesting, two of them have to do with what I had next I was going to answer. Um, one of them, did I ever force my child to speak to the banker? Absolutely not. But I spent, con we worked conscientiously throughout his childhood and teen years helping him develop and go in that, and he eventually felt more and more confidence, more and more confidence, and whatever it is that makes someone shy, it shows he had a lot of opportunities, and he clearly overcame it, and did really well. And like, the people who know him as an adult, to go, you're a lying, okay, because he developed, and it took a long time. And I had some who just would never shut up. They would speak to anybody, okay? <laughs> then you have to work at saying, you have a lot of good things to say, but shut up. <laughs> That's, you have to work that well, too. You have to really help, you know? And so they work throughout their lives. We just felt that was a way to do it. Um, and so how do you fix or train my kid once we've left the training stage? There is no fix. <laughs> okay, but the tool of training, the focus of training is gone. There's still training to go on, but it's different. You don't go, now let's practice and let's role model. How? You can't do that, but you are continuing to work with them. But it's not a training, it's more of an equipping. Remember, it's more coming alongside them and letting them go in front of you. So you, there is some here, but your training manual just goes, and so much more of wisdom and relationship. You still have to parent, but so much of it's requiring not reminding, and then you have the good con conversations. And you talk about, now, are they going to like it? No! They want to do what they want to do. So what I will say with this, one of the things you want to teach them, and you want to start way back here with choices. And you want to go, That's, I love that, that's a good choice. Let's remember to make good choice. What a good choice you did. We're talking like that from when they're little, and that's one of the things, direct confrontation, particularly with certain uh, temperaments, doesn't work real well. Well, but give them choices. Do you want to put your shoes on here or in the car? So you give them options, but you're always still the parent. Never quit being the parent. Um, it just looks different. Okay, so. As you teach them more, you want choices and consequences to be your gra great teacher. And in the red zone, it becomes your really good friend. And someone says, so, so how do I know what to do? Well, one of the things is consequences. Uh, it was an old Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. Not open. And it's, the song was like the punishment hit the crime. And it's great. Natural consequences are really your friend. Okay, now everything can't be natural consequences, but for example, they leave their bike out and they didn't put it up, you didn't nag them, but they have a consequence. 
I'm so sorry tomorrow you can't, no, I wouldn't say I'm sorry. Do we responsible if you buy it? And they go, okay, so I'm sorry. You've lost the privilege. You can't ride your bike tomorrow or whatever it is. You get up in these years, this is one of your friends. <laughs> okay. It's your biggest enemy, but it's also a friend. One of mine probably lost phone privileges more than they had. The reason I say they is because, I mean, I'm sorry, you lost your phone. Okay? And the response was very poor. Now you've lost it three days. Now you've lost it until they quit responding the way they shouldn't have responded. So, let it fit the crime if you can. And the other thing, well, how much do I let them make their choices and give them freedom? So we kind of, how do we protect them? Well, for one thing, I think don't give them the freedom of a choice if you're not ready to let them take the full brunt of the consequences. Okay? 15 year old daughter, and she goes, Mom, it's really cool. I think I should go down and whatever downtown by myself at 11 o'clock at night. No, <laughs> I'm not going to let her pay those consequences. Or uh, certain parties or something. There are things where I go, I'm, I'm not going to let you have that freedom of that choice. Okay, because I don't want the full brunt of the consequences. If it comes to school and grades and things, let consequences be your friend. You'll be so glad to have them, but you have to hold them accountable. You can't not hold them accountable. So whatever your educational choices are or is, then be sure you hold them accountable and let consequences be the teacher. Okay. But not when you're not willing. So put the least letters down. D B T O. D B T O. Very much in the red year. Absolutely down here. Don't fail them out. Okay, there's always some places of grace. Okay, but as a general rule, don't fail them out. A lot of times when moms let our hearts get in the way of what's best for our children, bailing someone out, except unusual situations. It's really usually not good parenting. It's not what's best for them. Okay, and I'll try to get to some of these. These were good questions. A lot of them. Okay, this one uh, tags onto what I was going to talk about. How involved should grandparents be in the discipline choices, the parenting of the grandchildren? What if what I do and my husband is different from what the grandparents think should be done? Okay? I will tell you, you're responsible for God and to the government to raise your, to parent your children. Your parents have their opportunity, okay? Part of this is what someone mentioned is they're not understanding this, and they're showing great disrespect to you, or they're just ignorant they don't understand. So I would help them to understand where your boundaries are. Um, it's tough. And I talked to somebody last week about it. Her parents walking all over her authority as a parent, disrespecting her. I hear it all the time from you moms, that your parents or in-laws are countermanding what you say, sometimes in front of the children. Okay? Unless it's an unusual circumstance, I would say that's not acceptable. You are responsible for your children. And there, there's got to be flexibility, okay? And you want your parents, generally, they're a good influence. You want grandparents. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that goes on. But not to let them disrespect you. So I would draw boundaries, and I would start the conversation. I love you very much. I wish you could support what we're doing. If you want it, I want you to explain it. I'll be glad to. But I have to ask you to respect the boundaries and what we're doing as parents. And you have to understand, when you do this, it undermines my work as a parent. Mom, Dad, 
I can't let that go on. If it's in-laws and you're married, I let your husband have this conversation. Sometimes it's so bad, I would say, let the husband have the conversation with your parents because they aren't hearing it. Mm -hmm. And if you have to, you may have to draw thicker and thicker boundaries with, with them if it's necessary. It's important in parenting your children so your parents will respect you. That's what they need to do. If they don't agree, very politely, keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to say that to them. But it, it is very hard. But I'm shocked. And how many of you moms tell me that your parents are criticizing and demeaning what you do or countermanding you and let your children do what you ask them not to let them do? Parent your children. Don't be afraid of your parents. Okay? They've done their job. Now, if there's a money trail attached, it makes it a lot harder. But that's what, well, how I would recommend it. Because you want, Mom, I want you involved with my children. I want it. But not the sacrifice of your respecting me as a parent. And it's our job to raise our children. So come alongside. But please don't step in front. Uh, I think that was, yeah, somebody else. I couldn't believe how the father, don't put up with it. Okay. It's wrong. That's not healthy. That's not a healthy boundary. Um, okay, a appropriate, along with the choices that we were talking about, another thing I would equip you with is you're not, you may not be asking the right question. Most moms I talk to, 98%, they're asking the wrong question. They go, how and what? Okay, how do I do this? What is this? What's the way to do this? How do I do this? And at the bottom line, we're asking the wrong question. Also, what I'm getting ready to tell you, a lot of people say, how do you keep it up? I'm worn out. I don't have the endurance to go another 20 years or whatever. How do you keep it up? And I think if you ask the right question, it can kind of help you. And the question's not how or what, but who. Look at your six-month-old, six-week-year-old, six-year-old. Not who do I want this child to be when they go to first grade. Who do I want this child to be when they graduate from high school or college or get married or get a job or stay home with their family. That's not the who. I would recommend you look at them and think of them as a 45-year-old, full-grown adult fully responsible in their career or their family or their marriage, their life, and you're respecting them as a parent, right? Okay, that person, the who, that's the person you want to think about. So when you're making decisions, think about that person that you want to equip. Not the short term, but the long term. But the problem is you have to be kind of bifocal about it. Actually, in the book of Hebrews in the Bible, in chapter 12, verse 2, Jesus, who was perfect, the God-man, he also looked at things with a bifocal look while he was here on earth. So 12, 2 talks about how he endured the shame and pain and disgrace of the cross. Because he did what no human being could do. He had to pay the penalty for my sin and for his children's sin. So he had to endure that. He was a full 100% person. And so it says he endured the shame, and I can't remember the rest of it, of the cross because of the joy set before him. So he's living and looking here as we need to as moms, we need to be really in this moment and realize he's only six years old. He may only be 17 years old, but he's only 17 years old or 23. So we need to be here in the moment with who they are. Talker, shy, whatever it is. And we need to keep an eye on the joys set before us when they're 45. 
And you don't have to raise them at all. You just get the opportunity to have a relationship with them. And so in Jesus' case, the joy set before him is me, my salvation, my redemption. That was part of the joy. That's why he went to the cross with his bifocal looking ahead to the redemption of his children because he was paying for the penalty. And then also to be exalted in heaven back where he was fully God in heaven, still fully man, but functioning and glorified. That's what he did. So that picture, bifocal, that will help you endure because, wow, sometimes the days seem really long or a season feels really long. So you want to keep an eye on where you're going and the who that you want and let that fuel you and keep your energy. Somebody stop the clock. <laughs> um, I have so many questions. I get asked all the time, how do I get to the heart of my children? Because that's really it. Everything else is just coding on the outside. You know, it is important to train. All of the things you do, changing your diapers, trying to learn, what do I do? I vaccinate a win or do I do this? Do I do your educational choices? Will I ruin them if I do one? All of those things that you're afraid about, which is permeates your generation, you know. All of that, it is something. It's an enormous responsibility. Um, but it's the heart of your child that's going to matter to them and to you. I could all along, but as an adult, the rest of his life. So what I want to do, let me uh, see what. Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs in the Bible, it says, above all else, guard their heart. Okay, so the Bible ingredients, in fact, it talks about heart a thousand times. Uh, okay, it's a, a great teacher used the imagery to me about apple nailing in our parenting, that if you have a crummy tree, like next door, are, they have pears. This floor is not as hard as the pears. Mm -hmm. They are just mm -hmm. horrible. And what the squirrels do is they go, yes, pears. And they grab them, and they take a bite of them, and they go, oh, that was terrible. And then they grab another one, and they bite them. That one's bad, too. And a lot of times they bring it onto my deck, come over here and go, I'll eat it over here. So I have parts, partially in the world, like he got pears. Okay. But this teacher was, in parenting, he was using apples. He was saying he has a crummy apple tree, and so the way he can everybody think he has a great apple tree, if he would nail beautiful apples all over the tree. Like honey crust, and there and say, ha ha, you know. Okay, Trader Joe's in the fall has honey crisp apple cider. It's like drinking honey crisp apples. Okay, so <laughs> nail beautiful honey crisp apples all over your tree. It looks really good. But winter comes, it's spring, they're all shriveled and gone, and you got the hockey bucks again. So you're not fixing it because you're not getting to the root, to the heart of the matter. Same thing. We want to do wise things. We want to be the wisest moms that we can. But it's getting to our children's hearts. So let me give you a few ways not to get to your children's heart that a lot of us do all the time. Number one, uh, it's bribery. Oh, sure, I would never bribe my children. Okay. No, actually, worse than that's threat. Okay, threat is really bad. You don't do this, you go. Okay, threat is really dangerous. Okay, it's very unhealthy. Uh, you hear it, don't you pick that up all. Okay, I'm very sad because I think I know a lot of women who are raised in homes like this. That threat was the way the parents tried to keep control, tried to make their do their apple nailing so it looked better than it really was. Threats do not work. There's no character development. It's pure manipulation. So your children are trained. I either cave in or pay terrible consequences a lot of time. All right? And they never learn to respect their authority. So this one is truly unhealthy. And 
Um, if you struggle with it because it's how you were raised, get some help. Get somebody to help you. Okay? So threat's really bad, but <laughs> manipulation is what all of us do. Mm. Worst word, bribery, is really what it is. It feels so much more loving than the threats did. Okay? And the reason that we do it is because it appears to be working. Okay? But it's apple nailing. Is it getting to the roots? No. Okay, it's apple nailing. How about the, be careful of the word if? Listen to this. If you won't cry when I put you in your seat, I'll give you some candy. We'll go through the drive through at Chipotle. Um, if you come here, I'll tell you something special. Because they're completely rebelling against you. You're manipulating and bribing them rather than training them and teaching them about authority. Um, if you'll just eat one bite, I'll give you some dessert. You see how easy those flow out of our mouths? So be very careful with the word if. Um, it can start really innocently, but it can become a pattern. Um, when you go, if you make the honor roll, we'll buy your car. Wow, if you, and it sounds really good, be so careful, it's not bribery. Uh, it develops selfishness. You're not teaching your children delayed gratification. You're teaching greed and selfishness because they're not coming to you because they're respecting your authority. They're respecting you as a parent. They've been trained. This is the right thing to do. They only come in because you give them what they want. And so they go, Chick fil A, no way, I won't, you know, it has to be a bronze, whatever, triple hot foot. So see, it's teaching the wrong things. Um, and again, beautiful apple crisp nailed, you never get into the root. Uh, guilt, a real good one's mom, or really bad with this one. It does not approach the heart, and it denies. True compassion and sympathy. I work so hard and here you are. And we did all of this. We're teaching a really bad way to interact in a healthy way. That you put guilt on them to get them to do what you want them to do. It's manipulation the other way around. Be so careful. Um, it's a temporary fix and um, it can develop codependency and people pleasing. If you have a child that has those tendencies, for those of us that are people pleasing, you go, oh, mom, okay. And you're putting fuel instead of teaching them healthy ways of doing it, we're helping to fuel the fire and so forth. So it's not good. Okay, so how do we connect with their hearts? Like a pastor, I'll give you, I think, five things that start with H. Okay, number one is practice honesty. Be genuine. Your children can smell when you're fake. They smell it, okay? Um, your hypocrisy is about the worst thing you can do because of all the ways it works. You say one thing, you do another. It's better just not even to say it. If you can't walk, be genuine. I'm not saying put it all out there inappropriately, but let what you say and what you live match is one of the best ways to get through kids' hearts. Now, you may not hear that until they're 45 or 30 and have their own children, and you may never hear it. But I will tell you, your genuine honesty will get to your child's heart in a way your hypocrisy never will. Um, and we don't have time. I can give you examples. Oh, Mom, you do it. One time, Mom, you roll your eyes. But Dad, I didn't think anybody saw it. <laughs> and it was one of the crucial places in all my parenting years. I had the opportunity to explain it away or to do something. I knew I couldn't deny it, but I didn't. I was able to, one, I'm telling you, it was <coughs> triumphant parenting, not failure. I owned up to what I did that was wrong. And I asked his forgiveness. And so I admitted I was wrong, and then at night at table, in front of everybody, I apologized to Bill, asked his forgiveness, and then I did it with all the kids.
okay? One of the best parenting things I ever did, okay? Which might have looked like failure, but I am so proud that God enabled me to man up, I guess you have to say person up, I had a person up, <laughs> what I was doing at the um, Second age, practice humility. It goes with this. You're not perfect. Admit your mistakes. Do not give your children emotionally more than they need to hear. But admit your mistakes. I'm really sorry. That was wrong with me. Would you forgive me? Mom, you didn't show up when you said you're going to. I am so sorry. Practice humility instead of giving excuses. And in fact, in the book of 1 Peter in the Bible, God says he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. I don't want God resisting me. Um, and surprisingly, so do our children. Your children, I found my children to be so gracious to me when I'm willing to humble myself and apologize and be genuine. Um, learn to say I'm sorry really well. No if, ands, or buts. I'm so sorry. I never meant to hurt you. I am so sorry. Particularly, it is one of the most powerful things you can do in this time. And then going on in their 20s, I'm really sorry. Can you forgive me? Um, I would really carefully consider whether you need to explain it. I would just look at them and apologize. It gets to their hearts. Uh, next one is practice handling their hearts with tenderness for the treasure that it is. Practice handling their hearts with tenderness for the treasure that it is. Um, this is why anger never produces the righteousness of God in your parenting. Anger does not have a place in your parenting. If you struggle with anger, work on it. That's a whole thing I'd love to talk with you about, a whole way to walk through it. Get help with your anger. I will tell you this, as long as your children are safe, if anger is a part of it, get them safe and get out. Okay? Not even that you might make steps that would be harmful, but just your anger. Leave, get yourself under control, and come back. Because the really wonderful thing is to start all over again tomorrow, <laughs> or later tonight. Uh, Paul Tripp is my very favorite parenting tutor to me, and he says, good parenting is 10,000 unremarkable conversations. With my, I bet I've had 100,000 unremarkable, not conversations about the universe and what are you going to do with your life, unremarkable. When you are late to pick them up, or they're late getting ready, or they're just blown at today with their friends, or they're crying because they don't have all the questions, what do I do? They don't have friends. Okay? That's when you need to come around and begin those conversations. And some of the questions are about sexuality and discussion like that. All those conversations just start when you're two appropriately. Okay, what you talk with your little ones, you wouldn't talk with a 17-year-old or a 12-year-old. But you have the conversations. So it's an ongoing conversation about your worldview, your heart view, your life, so you can be discussing with them. Particularly, I want to throw out there's a really good book called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. It was probably written for like a 10-year-old-ish but it's a great one to talk about all the stuff on here. Because, like, people say, well, my kids don't even have a phone. Yeah, but everybody else does. Okay, you have no idea what, they, what they've been exposed to, what's a part of their life. So begin that conversation. Appropriately equipping, have the place where they feel safe to you. Remember, that's what we want to talk about. You want them to be able to come, not with their victories, but with their failures. There's a great, um, we have these books. 
Okay, do you know Schalte Feldheim? She's so good. These are what her books look like. Okay, for parents only. It's so good. She did research and then she talks about it. Okay, and it says 96% or something of teens. And these are teens across demographics, across faith boundaries, everything. They say, sure, I'd tell my parents more if they wouldn't freak out. Okay, when she did this, there was a lot less in our culture to freak out about. Because this is more than two years old. There's more today than there was this time last year to freak out about. So get this book, it's really good. Oh, and here, she wrote one for women only. If you're married, fantastic. It is so good. Um, and this is what I consider the single best parenting resource besides the parenting podcast and impact parenting <laughs> that I know of. It's Paul Tripp's Parenting, 14 Gospel Principles that Can Radically Change Your Family. It is superb. It is clearly written from a biblical worldview. It is absolutely wonderful. Talking about getting the heart of your child. Um, I love this. In fact, our trip book is two Ps. I would recommend him as a resource. Okay, and then for your marriage, okay, for your marriage, this is Dr. John Gottman. And if we had time to talk about, he is the one who really began the conversation about um, emotional IQ, EQ. So he's very famous for that. But this is Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. He's a yarmulke wearing Jew, so he has a general Judeo Christian worldview. This is a practical book, not one about the deep principles and so forth, but it's great. I would recommend it. There are some things that I would uh, ethically, not ethically, but morally, he kind of cuts it a little differently than I would, but this is so great. I would recommend this if your marriage is in trouble. I would recommend it if your marriage is in a great place. I would recommend it. It's so fantastic. I have a dear friend who's a counselor, and she has walked people through this. She's, and if I can get your name if you want to go to her, but she's certified in this. She took people who came in back to back with each other with their suitcases on the floor, ready to quit. And they said, we gave this one last shot, but we're done. It isn't going to work. And she walked them through this and had a great, strong marriage. So these are just practical, and I just wanted to share that with you, um, to tell you that. Let's see. Oh, no, don't freak out. That's where we started. Okay, then quickly, <laughs> practice handling their hearts. Um, practice hands-on parenting. Give your children yourself, not your money, not the great next class to go to, or the best this, or the better that, or the more, or whatever. Practice giving your children yourself. Um, your children need you. Do life with them, not for them or to them. Now I know there are different seasons, different combinations, different circumstances, but if your bandwidth is this wide, give yourself to your children. Do life with your children. Don't do it for them. Uh, walking alongside us, I love when I teach, I love to talk prepositions. Alongside is the best place for you to do life with your kids. Um, take time to be their parent, not do their parenting. And then last, practice the habit of listening. Yikes. I have a whole great thing about listening. Um, don't practice talking. Practice listening. And most of that, again, is you connect with their heart. If they're little, physically get down. One of the things moms forget, because you're busy, you have an agenda, you have life. Getting your children to pick up their toys, to brush their teeth, to get to whatever, deliver something for you when they're going to work, whatever it is, we have so many plates that we're spinning at the same time. 
we just forget that they're really people. So take the time in it. You listen to them so they'll listen to you. Now you're going, but Cheryl, you don't know. I have four boys and told them, I don't know them. And I'm, no, 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 no. That's right. So one of the things when you can't listen, take the time to say, I can't listen well right now. When I'm finished with this, I'll come and I want to hear what you have to say. Whatever it is. It's hectic. It's going on. I really want to hear. I can't listen well. Give me the opportunity to do it. Then when they're happy and fixed, don't go, okay, now I can do the next 10 things on my list. Let them know they can trust you. And then you set down all your things and they are your agenda. And you're listening. One of the most, the most invested times I spent was on my stomach, on the floor, finding all about Lego Wars. And who is this and how they did this and what the castle was. And if you've got boys and Legos, you know what I'm talking about. Okay? It might be a video game. Mom. Your children say, Mom. You, that goes, boop, 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 boop. this is important. And if you can't listen, tell them, I won't come back, I want to listen. I can't listen well now, I'll come back. So listen to it, brilliant. My invested time in my stomach, how much do I care about Lego Wars, right? <laughs> or tanks. I'm going to tell you, we have three books on tanks on our shelves, for my boys' rooms, okay? All of them, nobody's at home, but I still have the tank books, because I hope to have grandsons, okay? <laughs> but, how oh, interesting. I don't care about tanks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about my son's parts. I never said I don't care about tanks. That's why they showed me the books on tanks. Okay? Um, uh, okay, I'm a widow mom. So when my son was 12 or 13, I thought, what can we do to connect and have fun? Okay? My girls, we can go shopping, they can flop on my bed, we can watch a chick flick together, we can eat popcorn, all of those things that you can do with a daughter. I couldn't do that with my 12-year-old son. So, God gave me the Oklahoma City Thunder. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm telling you, okay, you think it had to do with whatever's in the No, it didn't have to do with them. God brought it to town for me. So, Jonathan, I go, teach me about, I don't understand. Boom, 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 that's all I saw. And so he began teaching me, teaching me, teaching me. It became so fun for us. And then my other son, get involved too, ask questions. I mean, I'm like an expert. I can talk to you about everything that happened in free agency and what Presti's doing and are we going to rebuild and all the reasons for Russ to go to Houston and what Houston's things and Dem I mean, he has really taught me what I actually enjoyed a lot. Okay? But that was perk. Okay? It was my son's heart. And so it was going to like, I let him be the expert. And I was a student. And I listened and I asked. And then pretty soon somewhere and he goes, Mom, I don't even have friends who ask the questions you ask. Okay? Because I had to keep, keep asking questions to show I cared and I'm listening to what you're teaching me. Okay, this last year I family did a fantasy league. Okay? <laughs> I didn't know what fantasy leagues were. Like, I didn't realize that's the only reason the NFL is exists because of fantasy. <laughs> okay, all that to say, become a student, be interested in your children, listen, practice really good listening techniques. Um, don't be so busy. Making the urgent more important instead of the important my urgency. Don't be so busy that you make the urgent the important instead of making the important my urgency. It's really hard. This keeps you busier than the ten women need to be. The lure of this, the reality of this, the reality of life nowadays, okay? Keep remembering the hearts of your children and who you want to be and realize what happens through the red zone and out of it.
Lots of good questions. I'm just going to let y'all stop and talk, but we don't have time. Um, let me go through as quickly as I can. Someone trouble keeping their room clean? Um, it's a training your issue. Okay, you have to understand, children have vision ground blindness, is what I think it's called. <laughs> it really is. It's a term in psychology. That's one of the things, like at the Parenting Podcast, I like to bring really great wisdom. Not wisdom of just the ages, um, but wisdom of scientific studies. What do credible doctors and child development experts and neurologists, John Gottman with 15 PhDs, all of this, what do studies show? Um, if I could list for you, I could sit here an hour and list what show, studies show about the dangers of this. All right? But in this case, vision ground blindness is what it's called. If you've ever worked with your young children, and they say, yeah, mom, it's picked up, and you go in there, and it's still a wreck. <laughs> they don't see it. And secondly, they don't know how to tackle it. So your job is to patiently train them. Uh, and with ours, we started with clothes. And unfortunately, most of the clothes that are out all go in the dirty clothes, but that's fine because you're training. We do the big things. We do clothes, then we did books, stuffed animals. We start doing all of that. If you can, and then you start getting down, and the last thing are beads and Lego pieces and things that hurt your feet. Yeah. Okay? But you have to train them, and one of the gifts you can give them is containers, so they know where to do it. Not containers because it helps you keep your house clean and you're a little OCD about it, but you're gifting your children to show them how to do it. And so you work with them. If you have small children at home, stop during the day and Help them pick up so that they aren't overwhelmed with too much at the end. Also, the timer is a great thing. Okay, in 10 minutes, we're going to pick up. And then I like to have fun with my children. And doing things that are hard and boring and repetitious are so much more fun if you're having fun. So uh, we have friends over. I do it all the time. I do it with my kids. I go, wait, and now you have all these timers. But we used actual timers. Okay, so we're going to clean up, and do you think that I can make the sandwiches for lunch faster than you can pick up? No. <laughs> oh, yeah? No, you can't start yet. Don't start. Come on. Okay, all of that. I'm an extrovert who has more energy. Some of you internal processors are going. <laughs> okay, but if you can grab this much energy and have fun and be more lighthearted, it be such a delight to your children's hearts. So grab that energy from somewhere else. Because someone had a question about self-care. You do have to have a bandwidth, an emotional bandwidth. And children can take it out of you. This is a benefit to an external processor. But you have to understand, external processors are speaking 200,000 words a day. And they get emotionally worn out too. And they're doing too much. Internal processors, you tend to narrow your scope. External processors just keep it broadening their scope too much. So they wear themselves out. So remember about urgency and important? Save the energy for the Lego conversations. Save the energy for having a little bit of fun when you're doing the boring stuff. We don't have time to get into There's so much we can't get into. That's why we want to do the parenting podcast. But Save your energy so you can make the important your priority instead of all the things that won't matter when they're 36 years old because it's gone. Okay, those of you who have taken children through the red, the red zone and certainly past all this, it goes like that. Okay, and they're full adults before you know it. Treasure up those moments. In the book of Luke, Mary helped me because I was going, it's going through my fingers, it's always going, trying to hold on to the joy of the moment. Because I want to be there in this moment. And I go, oh, the moment's going too fast. You know, the one that sat in my lap, or their little back of their neck, she wanted to kiss, all these things. <laughs> it goes, Mom, I don't want to marry you, I don't want to marry anybody. <laughs> 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 That's what she 
taught me this. So when the wise men were there, and Mary knew her, she was at the Immaculate Conception. She knew this was God, man. He was the redeemer of the world. So she knew, and it says when the wise men came and brought their gifts, Mary treasured these things up in her heart. So when I get to heaven, I'm going to thank her because she has equipped me so well. Because I go, now I'm not trying to grasp all the time. Instead, everything, whatever it is. Your busy, busy, busy daughter stops and goes, Mom, how are you doing? I'm going to go get coffee. <laughs> and instead of going clean, 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 which makes them pull away, treasure it up. Allow yourself, if you can, the bandwidth to let your teenagers talk to you late at night. That was one of the questions. What do I do when I have littles and lakes? Okay, both of them, it's really hard. The whole thing, circadian rhythm with your, with your teens, they do, do better staying up late and sleeping later. Okay, and your littles don't. And this mandibular joint in someone over the age of 13 starts working at about 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you want to miss that one who's running through the red zone? Do you want to miss? So you've got to save some energy for that. Gather up your energy like you do. Oh, I'm going to put my phone. You know, my phone was going down when I was out south in Oklahoma City, so I put it on whatever it is where it only uses like that much energy. <laughs> so if I have a car wreck, I can call somebody. <laughs> time and time. All right? Do the same thing with yourself. Put yourself some time on energy mode. And now if you're married, I'm going to tell you, don't use all your energy on your children. Mm -hmm. Okay? Say you're in a covenant relationship of marriage. It is the relationship that will shape your children's lives. Okay, are marriages messy? Yes. Some marriages end. And I'm not talking about, and there's grace. I'm talking about if you are married, save best energy for time with your husband. I was bad about this. Both of us thought, wow, if we were in a boat that capsized, we'd both grab a child. Okay, so we did too much pouring energy into our children until we grew up enough to go, that's stupid. Okay, this is a lifelong relationship. We want it to be a lifelong relationship. We want it to be what impacts our children. And so began saving up energy for each other. Okay. Not a panacea, but a really wise way. And, hey, what if we did this? Okay. Your husband will probably go through it four times slower than you will. <laughs> okay. okay, my time is up. Ah, let me see. It's too much. Okay. This is part one. Yeah. <laughs> Stay in touch with us. Watch on social media to know in the parenting podcast. These are the kinds of things that we want to have conversations about on the parenting podcast. All right? To be relevant, but to bring listening to the conversation. Okay? Keep writing. I know some of you are still writing. Let me have your email. Watch for us. And be sure and like us. Share us. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you.